Okay, uh, welcome to the Democratic Radical Governance Panel. I'm Fran Reyes, uh, engaged in the blockchain ecosystem since 2012, uh, where some of the projects uh, that we will, what will be presented today have emerged, uh, as well as in the social economy sector, among many other interests. Uh, it's a pleasure to moderate today's uh, panel, which is uh, filled with three uh, really different projects uh, at the first glimpse, at least, but also with so many things in, in common. In this session, we will explore the frontiers of governance and how new mechanisms like uh, collective civic data management, collective voting, collective ownership, and common good management, uh, among others, could help surpass some limitations of governance. Several of these uh, limits are known, uh, including the complexity of being informed and uh, deliberate, deliberate to meet everyone's need, the tyranny of majority, Dunbar number, the 1990 rule and the tyranny of the leisure time crowd, among many other basis limitations and defects in governance. The development of technologies like the internet, blockchain or cryptographic mechanism allow the, primit the primitives to manage a society with more efficiency in terms of fulfill the people's need uh, with an ethical perspective. And the project we will present today, uh, that's our Liverpool Civic Data Cooperative, uh, the NIM Tech Project and the Radical for Change are representatives of this new generation of initiatives that no longer try to give voice uh, to the people, but to create the primitives so that the people can move from awareness to activism and to build alternatives in an autonomous way without intermediaries and in a democratic uh, way. It is, it's more necessary than ever to ensure that projects such as the ones we will present today succeed in today's world, where corporativism hides behind the guise of technological maximalism and techno-optimism. And as a part of today's session, each speaker will have seven minutes uh, to present their projects briefly, and then we will move on to ask a few questions. If we have time, also uh, some questions from the, from the public. Uh, I will just mention them uh, in order of presentation or, or speakers, and that, that, then I will let them introduce, introduce themselves if they want, and also their, their projects. So we have today uh, Gary Leming, uh, Director of the Liverpool City Data Cooperative, and Rema Patel, uh, Associate Director at the, at the Lovelace uh, Institute. Uh, Jaya Clark Brecker, from, uh, this Chief Strategy Officer uh, from the NIM Tech Project and Alex Vandazio, uh, that is the tech lead uh, from the Radical for Change Foundation. So without um, anything else from my side for now, I will uh, let Gary start his presentation. Uh, I need to start my video again. I don't know if the I'm sorry, screen I'm just is having, shared. Yeah, I'm just having a problem with screen, sharing the screen. Just bear with me one second. Um, okay. No problem. Okay, so hoping right so are, are you now able to see the, the slides probably not yeah I'm not seeing <laughs> I, we, were, we were a second ago <laughs> okay I'm um, sorry about this uh, let me just no. try that again all right okay is, 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 can you see the slides now? Yeah. yeah yes. Great. Okay. Yeah. So apolo apologies for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name's um, Gary Leeming, uh, Director of the LCR, um, uh, Liverpool City Region Civic Data Cooperative. I'm here with uh, my colleague Rima Patel from the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, Rima, I don't know if you just want to, is, is that enough of an introduction for you? 
Uh, yes, I work for the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is a research institute that's really interested in participatory approaches to data stewardship. So one of the things that we're doing is thinking about how to take some of the research that we've done on participatory mechanisms and embed them in, in new models for governing data. So that's our interest in there. Is that helpful? And the, the Civic Data Cooperative itself is, is as you can see, sort of a, um, very, an organisation that's uh, composed from um, uh, and funded by the Liverpool City Region, so by our, our metro metropolitan area, to look at um, how we can best uh, govern and manage the, the very rich um, and, and potentially valuable data sets that we have about our population um, for and with our population and our citizens, um, rather than kind of having it being um, sort of imposed on us from outside. We wanted to make sure that, you know, that this is, is um, um, so the public involvement is very much tied into to the work that's done, whether it's health data or, or, or the civic data. Um, is a key part of the message and that's what we'll be uh, discussing today is some of the challenges and approaches that we've had. So just moving on to the next slide, I'll just hand over to Rima to, to, to discuss um, some of the context for this in terms of what a data cooperative is. Great. Um, I'm not sure I can navigate this slide deck, so you might have to... Uh, if you just give me a nod when you want to switch. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk through the next slide. You're on the next next slide. Okay. Um, so the question here is, what is a data cooperative? And in a recent report, we define data cooperative as considered when individuals want to voluntarily pool data resources and repurpose the data in the interest of those it represents. So this is about the relationships um, being formed between peers or like-minded people who join forces to collectively steward the data. And um, there's different examples of this, but the classic one is in, in Barcelona, Salos, uh, which is a common good data license for health research. And here, the idea is that the goals and the purpose of a data cooperative are those held commonly by members and respond to their interest and also aspire to um, benefit wider society. So and so here the kind of con the governing principle is this concept of mutuality. So for all members, and membership is a really key feature of a data cooperative. They respect responsibility, rights, and benefits. And some of the features that something like Salus has is that members normally have a role in shaping the rules of how data is governed. Um, they have shared control of data access and use and they have involvement in setting terms and conditions for access and often they have um, accountability mechanisms like electoral mechanisms for involvement such as AGMs or voting on boards, that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of a quick whistle stop tour of what a data cooperative is. I'm a bit worried that you've not heard most of what I've said. I'm just wanting to check that that could be heard. Yeah, that's fine by for me. So the, so the next slide is why does this matter? And I'm hoping this will be visible at some point. Um, we, are, we are seeing the first slide, still the first slide um, oh. for some reason. Ah, now we are seeing the third slide, perfect. Okay. Um, maybe, Gary, if you can like uh, turn off your camera, so maybe it will be yeah, maybe better for streaming. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. And um, I guess this kind of question, which is why does this matter and um, what isn't the data cooperative? And so we've had um, some conversations about things like Toronto um, Sidewalk Lab project that attempted to uh, call a smart city project uh, a, a civic data trust. That was the term that was used. Um, and so that's a really good example of backlash um, against something that was seen as a power grab. Um, an effort to, to enclose or control data by um, the partner that was basically a Google-owned subsidiary um, 
and uh, and so some of the features of what a data cooperative definitely isn't is um, a power grab. It's not about owning other people's data, and it's not about misappropriating a term. So here you've got the term civic data cooperative, but a lot of people were really critical of the idea that you would describe this as civic or a data cooperative or a data trust. Um, and uh, Sean McDonald has done a lot of really interesting work on why that's really problematic. So um, this is a really good example of, of a vision that should not be achieved <laughs> when we're thinking about, about um, what, what a data cooperative is. Um, moving on to the next slide, Gary. Yeah, so um, in terms of where we are with the development of the this of, of what is a cooperative and what is a data cooperative in Liverpool, um, there are some things that we need to sort of set as the base, which is that you know, we are a multi-stakeholder uh, organisation. Uh, we have members from individual uh, family doctors, GP practices, through to large hospitals and, and local authorities or, or councils that hold large data sets. And, and they have um, obligations in um, information governance and data protection that they also need to meet and that we need to respect, um, as well as their own um, requirements around how um, they um, manage and use their data. So what we're looking to do is to build something that's around the concept of mutuality, the idea that coming together we can do more um, to focus on delivery of outcomes that we co-design with our residents and our citizens um, with uh, uh, under a, a sense of a common purpose so that we can then deliver um, a, a value that reaches beyond what any individual member could 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 meet um, while also meeting the expectations of our citizens and the picture on the right there is is from um, the, the a concert that was held earlier in the year during lockdown as part of the events research program that we participated in um, uh, alongside consultation with our residents to ensure that we were able to use um, medical data, ticket data and, and other civic data in order to make these events as safe as possible while also deriving the, the insights and learnings that we needed to think about how we reopen events um, post-pandemic, um, which is especially important in a city like Liverpool where the, we, we have such a strong um, sort of sector in um, uh, sort of tourism and, and, and entertainment. So the other thing that we've identified are, are you know, in terms of key aspects of this for public trust are that need to respect current data governance, but also the individual's right not to participate um, if they should choose to, to sort of opt out. Um, we're in a strange situation where unlike um, uh, other data cooperatives where you know people join um, the data are already in the system they're already there and so what we need is a mechanism to to ensure that people can um, sort of say that they don't want to participate even though the data may be there because it's needed for direct care purposes and that means also that we need transparency of activity that we need uh, to, to meet the obligation of informing people about what we're doing uh, and, and that that's all available at any time to anybody. And finally, we need those mechanisms for meaningful participation, not just from our stakeholders, but also from our citizens and for that to influence um, and, and to have a, a direct link to the decisions that are made that we can prove and demonstrate. So, um, a, 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 and, and while doing that, though, we also need to recognise that there are certain barriers to, to participation. And I'll just hand back to Rima to, to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the really interesting things that we've found is that the higher you set the bar for participation, the more likely it is that uh, some groups might find it harder to get involved. And that's really tricky, that how do you do this in a participatory way, but also make sure um, that you're accounting for things like inequality and the fact that the cost and the time of participation takes a long time. And that's always a risk with something like a data cooperative. So um, there's a sort of thing here, which is how do we um, build participatory mechanisms that enable that broader engagement. So uh, the sort of traditional features of a data cooperative I, I, I described earlier, but then there's also this really interesting thing, which is could we, um, for instance, think about radical transparency and what that looks like 
have to think like in um, Helsinki and in Finland, you've got these um, algorithmic audit registers, um, accountability checks and mechanisms that enable people to evaluate the impact of how data has been used, um, lived experience panels, uh, and, and here I'm sort of thinking of actually going to where people might be experiencing digital exclusion. So the classic example might be in the UK community library, um, where people go to access the support they need to get online, for instance, that kind of thing. Um, and then just things like citizen juries, um, actually giving people the time and the space and paying them to come and deliberate together um, to, to shape the, the mechanism. So uh, that's, again, a research report that sort of sets out lots and lots of different ways this can be built in. Next slide. Um, Gary, uh, Rema, uh, we have limited, limited amount of time. Uh, yeah. We have to stick on the, the schedule. Uh, like if you can wrap up like in the in the next uh, 20, 30 seconds, uh, sure. so we can uh, um, give the word to the next. Yeah, um, so, so sorry, Rima. And so, so we have this challenge of what is a member. And, and I think, that, again, that's drawn out of, of the report that Adel Lovelace has produced. In terms of what we're doing, um, you know, we have massive deprivation. So digital exclusion is a real challenge for us. So, and how does a data cooperative meet that challenge um, in a meaningful way that means that people who don't have easy access because they don't have access to, uh, they only have access to expensive data contracts on their phones or, or, or through, through pay monthly, uh, pay as you go type deals, means that we have some real challenges to how we demonstrate that public participation. And we're certainly, you know, one of the reasons for being here is to look for some, um, others who are uh, also dealing with this issue and, and how we might be able to collaborate. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm sorry if you're going over schedule. There was some technical issues there, clearly. Um, but um, if people are interested in getting in touch, um, that's my email address. I'm very happy to hear from people. Thank you, Gary and, and Rima. Uh, now we will uh, give uh, the word to uh, Jaya from Nim Tech. Hello, everyone. Um, I am switching off my camera and sharing the screen. Hang on. Can you see my first slide? Yeah, we Great. can see. Fantastic. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you so much to Gary and Rima for um, the presentation. I am definitely going to get in touch. I think that's super interesting, the work that you're doing up in Liverpool. Um, I would like to present uh, some of the work that we're doing at NIM. And uh, so first to introduce myself, um, I, my position at NIM is as a chief strategy officer, but before then I was in um, with a foot in academia and kind of more known for more of a kind of critical take and a critical theory take on the realm of tokens, blockchain, crypto economics, and this kind of thing. Um, so it is a kind of funny position for me to now be presenting, very excitedly presenting a, a tokenomic project. Um, but hopefully in this presentation, you'll see why I'm excited, because I think actually when it comes to the question of privacy and privacy uh, protections for global information infrastructure is actually a kind of tokenomic approach makes a lot of sense. Um, so just to say the kind of background to NIM as a project, um, was firstly the revelations by Edward Snowden back in 2013 um, of uh, the internet now being used as a mass surveillance device. Um, and then a few years after that, uh, the surveillance capitalism book by Zuboff that showed that um, that mass surveillance that Snowden was talking about is very intimately tied to a specific uh, set of business models um, that are kind of uh, prevalent or dominate uh, information infrastructures today. So, you know, our, our approach is a little bit along the lines that, you know, if surveillance is a business model, then we, what we need to change is not just the business model, but in fact, the entire environment around what is profitable to do. So if surveillance remains uh, a, the kind of, a kind of attractive, profitable uh, <coughs> perspective for in, in the Internet design, um, then, you know, we'll, we'll probably uh, not be able to, to change the dynamics. So the intention is really to change the kind of environment, um, the economic environment, uh, in order to, to have a kind of internet uh, context where, um, say, privacy becomes more attractive than surveillance. Um, 
you know, the, the question of why privacy is important might seem a little bit banal to go over, but I want to quickly, because there's a couple things that tend to get overlooked. Most people understand that, you know, we want privacy because we want to uh, protect the, the rights of minorities. We want to pr prevent discrimination and persecution of individuals and groups. Um, but there's a kind of broader societal reason for why privacy is important as well, which is basically that the type of data-driven surveillance and, and algorithmic infrastructures that we're, that we're uh, inhabiting today, you know, very much tend to go hand in hand with a certain type of control that, that uh, let's say, enforces norms um, and represses the, the, the space, the free space for experimentation, for growth and for change, both at an individual and a societal level. Um, and that this, in fact, you know, this ability to, to experiment freely um, without fear of repression, this, this ability to grow and to change is, in fact, also the basis for meaningful innovation. Um, uh, and having privacy, you know, allows for a much more meaningful engagement of, you know, data-driven innovations uh, down the line. Um, that's, you know, a topic for a whole other talk, so I'll just skim that over pretty quickly. Um, so the problem as we see it in NIM is that, you know, at the moment there aren't like super strong incentives essentially for uh, providing, you know, global privacy protections. Um, you know, there, there's a kind of aspect to government that is, you know, just a little bit too interested in, in, in what populations are up to. Um, although they also want to protect their their information networks from you know foreign spying, there is a tendency to nevertheless want to understand what's going on. Um, companies have the same problem. You know, even kind of privacy preserving companies will you know still be very interested in their customers' metadata, even if their data is encrypted, um, because they want to understand what their customers are up to, and also because you know data driven uh, data driven innovations is is a highly profitable field or projected to be a highly profitable field. So. You know, essentially, you know, the big actors don't have, you know, strong enough incentives to provide uh, global privacy. So the intention with NIM is that, you know, to provide, first of all, privacy protections at, a, you know, material level, meaning at the actual infrastructure network level. Um, and our kind of, let's say, our ethos, our, our aim is that privacy is a default. So rather than um, rather than having to opt out of sharing your data, you, you know, instead it becomes a choice to opt in, which, you know, to our mind will make a much more kind of, uh, create a much more meaningful environment around what data actually is and can provide for people. Um, we also believe that this infrastructure needs to be decentralized, um, geographically decentralized, uh, so that, you know, the kind of whims of one country or geopolitical interests of one country does not adversely affect uh, the privacy protections as of everyone else. Um, we also believe that it needs to be tokenized in order to ensure that there is actually an interest in running this infrastructure um, and that the infrastructure is sustainable and scalable in the long run. Um, this is a kind of uh, a, a overview schematic of what the infrastructure looks like. Um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, walking you through it because that's an entire talk in itself, but maybe it'll come up in the questions. Um, so just to give an overview of, you know, what tokenomics actually does internally for the NIM network. Um, the NIM network is what's called a, a mixed net. So if, you know, those of you who know um, the network Tor might be familiar with a little bit this idea of, you know, well, VPNs for Tor, you know, rerouting traffic through a number of nodes so that, you know, it's not so visible who's speaking to who. Um, but what we do in addition to that um, is also uh, to repackage the traffic so that, actually traffic packets um, look identical. You cannot see any kind of patterns. You cannot kind of see the, the size of the packets, um, which means that there's just an, an additional layer of, of privacy protections that protect not just the, the, the information itself, but also the metadata about the information. Um, so what happens uh, uh, in terms of tokenomics internally in the system is, you know, three main things. First of all, you know, we, we introduce a NIM token so that uh, people or organizations can use that in order to pay for the access of the infrastructure. So that's a very simple concept for most people to understand. You buy a token, uh, you pay into the system, which then gets paid on to the mixed nodes for doing the work of running the infrastructure and providing privacy. Secondly, perhaps slightly more, uh, slightly less um, familiar to people uh, that aren't in the kind of blockchain um, type of world, 
We also use the token to uh, for governance and to ensure the quality of the services provided by the network. So the idea here is that anybody who holds NIM token can also delegate some of these tokens to nodes in the network for doing good work. So the ones that are you know, providing excellent quality of service or nodes that are situated in geographical locations that you think should you know, also run a node in the network or that are run by organizations that you believe in ethically um, or for other reasons, um, you might want to delegate some of your NIM token to that node, um, which then allows it to take part in the network um, as part of the infrastructure uh, providing the mixing services. So it's almost, it's something along the lines of voting. Um, it's something along the lines of taking part in the governance of, of how the infrastructure is actually run. Um, so this is also a very important part of the, the tokenomics. And then finally, you know, people that do participate in these two ways, you know, either running nodes in the network or by delegating tokens to network nodes for running the network, um, everyone earns a share of the reward. So there's a kind of like virtuous circle of, of um, uh, nodes or of, of tokens being paid into the system and going to the to rewarding those who contribute to the overall um, quality of, of the, the network providing privacy. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, um, this is the overall aim. You know, the aim is to make surveillance technically impossible, but also to make it economically undesirable. So essentially to provide a kind of environment where the incentives for surveillance are removed both at an economic and at a, at a technical level. Um, so this is the kind of high level, let's say, uh, hypothesis of NIM. This is, this is what we're building also in a very real way. Um, right now, we're running a testnet that has 5,000 nodes all over the world. Um, we have 30 validators who validate the, the tokenomics, who validate the, the token transactions. Um, and, uh, and we're building towards um, launching a kind of live mainnet um, by the end of the year. Um, so this is, this is what we're working on. This is the hypothesis. This is the aim. And we very much welcome you know, engagement, um, feedback, and, and uh, both critical and, and positive, of course. So please do get in touch. Um, this is me, my Twitter handle. This is um, the NIM information. Thank you, Jaya, for, for your presentation. Uh, now we'll let pass to uh, Alex Vandaccio from the Radical for Change Foundation project. All right, I'll quickly share my screen here. Okay, can you see that and can you see me? Uh, yeah, if you can, like, just turn off the camera. Oh, turn off the camera, okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. That's perfect, great. Okay. Um, I'm Alex Randaccio. Uh, I'm a project developer at the Radical Exchange Foundation. Um, so Radical Exchange Foundation, uh, we're, we're committed to advancing plurality, equality, community, and decentralization through upgrading institutions such as democracy, markets, data economy, uh, the commons, and identity. Uh, so I'm gonna speak to you today about a project that I'm working on right now called that we're referring to as uh, RxC Voice, um, which focuses on the upgrading democracy part of what I just said. Um, so our, the problem we're trying to solve with this project is uh, we want to empower groups of people to articulate their wants and needs better to to better make uh, decisions together. So as we all know, as groups get larger, this gets more and more difficult. Uh, so to illustrate this, imagine, uh, you, you know, think about neighborhoods and communities. Um, in, a neighborhood, in, a, in a neighborhood or a city or a community of that size, uh, everyone who is a member of that group has all kinds of uh, really important ideas, opinions, uh, localized knowledge, 
and proposals about how to improve the community. Um, but there's this problem where it's uh, a lot of that gets lost. It's really hard to bring all that. All of that is really important to um, the process of making decisions in the community. But it's really hard to input all of those ideas that are dispersed throughout every member of the community and output action. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve with RxE Voice. And uh, what RxC Voice is, is we have developed this web app that's sort of uh, that, that's in beta right now that we're using to kind of experiment in this area and um, illustrate sort of what's possible. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what uh, about this problem with how, how does this process of making a decision as a group uh, scale. What are what are the main? I'm going to focus on three of the main problems uh, that arise when when democracy scales. So here are the three problems that I'm going to focus on. The first is surfacing leadership is difficult. Um, traditional uh, decision making processes uh, tend to uh, miss out on um, localized uh, trust networks and uh, sort, of, sort of organic, informal forms of leadership. Uh, second problem is uh, deliberation is difficult at scale. That's one that we're all very familiar with. And then the third is uh, in, um, in, you know, once you get to uh, voting, traditional voting mechanisms have all kinds of uh, difficulties and problems, one of one uh, famous one of which is tyranny of the majority. So I'll begin with the problem of surfacing leadership. So whenever a group is trying to make a decision uh, and the decision has dispersed effects, the first question is who gets to make the decision, of course, and how much influence does, you know, each person who uh, is affected by the decision or is a member of the group uh, is going to have. So we, uh, the way we're thinking about this is we want to take advantage of informal leadership uh, without giving away, with, without um, it, all the individuals in the group giving away or delegating away completely the right to participate directly in the de decision-making process so that we don't miss out on the, uh, you know, localized knowledge that people have. Um, Oops. Um, so um, I, I can't see the chat here. Uh, is there a, I just want to, I'm hearing a lot of chats. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Is there a way I can do both here? Oh, don't worry. Um, it's a side chat. Carry on, oh, please. Okay, sorry, okay, for the okay. sorry for disturbing. No, no problem. No problem. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me and everything and that I'm not steaming ahead. Um, cool. So, like I said, we want to take advantage of, of, uh, of, of leadership in a community, basically, without completely delegating away, delegating away the right to participate directly. Um, another way of framing this is we want to take advantage of specialized knowledge while also capturing localized knowledge. Uh, so we're, you know, in, in capturing localized knowledge, plurality, uh, diversity of opinion, and so on. So our approach in the democratic process that we have created with RxC Voice, um, we allow voters to delegate sort of fractions of their voice. So we, at the beginning of a democratic process in RxC Voice, each voter uh, receives an equal number of what we call voice credits. And uh, we usually begin with 99. So each voter gets 99 voice credits. And then what I have here is uh, this is a screenshot of the interface. When you first log into the app, you can see a list of all of the participants in the decision. And you can you know, use the, these buttons here to give any number of your 99 voice credits to as many people in the group as you like. Um, and to encourage people to signal, uh, to, provide, to provide these signals of who they trust in the group, we uh, actually match their transfers from a matching pool. 
uh, and we we match the transfers according to a formula that gives a bonus to individuals who receive a, a wider base of support. So if one person in the community receives uh, any number of voice credits from, say, ten people, ten other people in the community, um, that signals they have a you know a wider base of support, and so that person receives a bonus relative to what uh, another person would receive if they only got a transfer from from one other person. So that's the first part of the process. And what you end up with is this, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of our take on liquid democracy and you end up with this distribution of political influence that's democratically determined. So that brings us to the next problem that deliberation is hard at scale. So um, the next part of the process is uh, meaningful conversations are, are really important to the next part of the process. Sorry, sorry for the inter uh, interrupting you, uh, Alex, but we have like uh, three minutes more, but then uh, it has to be like a one minute and a half for your presentation. So if you can like wrap up as fast as possible, it will be amazing. Sure thing. Uh, okay, so mm -hmm. um, so in, this in, in the deliberative part of a decision-making process, we need to surface opinions, localize knowledge and proposals. Um, and it's hard to do that at scale, but you know, even if we can just collect proposals from all the individuals in the group, uh, we we might miss out on meaningful conversations between those people. Because the second thing that's important is when people engage with other perspectives, their opinions evolve and they contribute a higher quality of proposals. And as we all know, the you know most common uh, online at scale deliberative tools right now or social media apps like Twitter and Facebook and they're terrible at this. Uh, they, you know, they fall into just divisive argument. So in this part of the process, we use this tool called Polis, uh, which seeks to kind of skirt that problem by uh, everyone can submit proposals, but no one can reply to a proposal. So it doesn't just devolve into arguments about one divisive statement. You have to continue to move on. You can click agree or disagree to each one, but then you have to move on. And you can submit as many as you want. You have this great kind of meaningful conversation at scale where people are confronting other perspectives in a sort of like rapid fashion and moving on. And they can continue to submit more and more uh, proposals as their opinion evolves. So to quickly cover the final step, uh, which is voting. Um, traditional one person, one vote, uh, you know, voting mechanisms have a couple problems. One that's familiar to us is tyranny of the majority, um, where, uh, you know, you have a, a minorities can often obviously be sort of dominated by majorities in one person, one vote systems. Uh, but another problem is uh, sort of tyranny of the indifferent or apathetic minority where you can have uh, you know, high uh, polarization. And then the uh, two sides of the debate are kind of in, uh, kind of in a gridlock. And then you know, a, a minority in the middle who really cares the least ends up making the decision. That's obviously not optimal either. So we use uh, quadratic voting, which is uh, a new voting mechanism, which seeks to kind of skirt those problems again. So with those voice credits that you have left over from the first part of the process, you have a list of proposals on the ballot that are generated from the community in the previous step. And you can vote on as many of them as you like with the budget that you have to express your preferences for against each one. And you can not only express yes or no to each one, but you also get to express the magnitude of your preference. Um, so this you know, this gives a much richer detail uh, in, the, in, the, in the image we get of the preferences of the community um, because you don't just have a winner takes all situation. You end up with uh, graphs that look like this here where, you know, these are the, each one of these bars is a proposal and on the y-axis here is the number of votes, the total number of effective votes they receive. Um, but for, before I finish, a, a key, component of quadratic voting is that, um, so if I go back here, there's a quadratically increasing cost to each 
uh, marginal uh, vote that you add to any one proposal. So if I want to, that puts a cost on uh, extreme views. So it, I can't, that sort of uh, is a counterweight against the ability of a, a minority group to sort of take over a decision. If, if I care a lot about proposal A, uh, I can't just, you know, spend 99 voice credits and have that count as 99 votes. The, it's actually one vote costs one voice credit, um, two votes costs four voice credits, and so on and so forth. Um, so that one person can't fully swing an election. However, you get this sort of more uh, uh, detailed output. Alex, uh, like some seconds more? If yeah, that, to finish that, I can stop there. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you, Alex, and thank you all for, for your presentation and your insights. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, so we don't have time for, for questions. Um, but yes, I mean, you are like public projects. If people uh, is interested, they can they can uh, contact you on and be involved in the projects. So thank you very much for, for your participation and thank you also the people for, for attending the panel. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, bye.